Welcome back to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay in Washington, and thank you for joining us again in our history of modern Libya. And joining us again from Biddeford, Maine, is Ali Amida. He's a professor and chair of the Department of Political Science at the University of New England in Biddeford. He specializes in political theory and anti-colonial resistance in modern Libya. And he's the author of The Making of Modern Libya and Forgotten Voices, Power and Agency in Colonial and Post-Colonial Libya. Thanks for joining us again, Ali. Thanks again. So we left off, essentially, to, to simplify it, uh, a regime led by Gaddafi comes to power in 1969, more or less popular, overthrows the Western-inspired monarchy, uh, introduces some reforms. Oil had been found nine, ten years earlier, so now there's increasing oil wealth. It's increasingly shared amongst the Libyan people. Uh, Gaddafi, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but in a fairly popular way amongst the Libyan people who have a history of being occupied by fascists. That spirit, you could say, is reflected in uh, Gaddafi's support for national liberation movements in, in Africa and even abroad, Latin America and other places. So how do we go from there, where he's more or less popular, to today, where it seems most of the people want to overthrow him? Well, there are a number of factors that uh, that uh, occurred after the 1980s. One, that the economy deteriorated, uh, people's lives began to be undermined, the social welfare state that was guaranteed earlier began to really uh, be shaken. And then the regime engaged in a disastrous confrontation with the United States uh, that led to the Lockerbie disaster later on. A Pan Am 747 jumbo jet with 255 people on board has crashed just north of the Scottish border. It crashed into a petrol station and a number of houses. Eyewitnesses report a huge explosion and a 300-foot fireball. There were 240 passengers and 15 crew on board. And the sanctions were imposed by the United States and also by the United Nations on Libya. So talk a little bit about that confrontation. First of all, what were Gaddafi's motivations for getting into a fight at that level and describe what happened. Well, what happened is I think the viewers should know that under the Reagan administration, we have a new Cold War. The rhetoric of, of the Cold War was re re revived. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. And Gaddafi, even though, um, you know, he was anti-communist, he was seen as really a sponsor of terrorism, and his regime saw themselves as supporters of liberation movements. That led to sponsoring um, some um, groups in Europe, and the Reagan administration's bombing of Benghazi and Tripoli, where around uh, 60 people were killed, including his adopted daughter. So that confrontation was uh, really crucial in understanding the psyche of the regime, you know, whether we, he was respond, his regime responsible for the Lockerbie or not, it seems that there is an indication that they were responsible, even though the case hasn't been resolved completely. And uh, after uh, 1992, there was evidence uh, shown to connect Libyan secret uh, intelligence officers to the Lockerbie bombing, and that led to the coming of the sanctions. Now, what, why, what do you make of what happens to Gaddafi himself during all this and what motivates him? I mean, it's one thing to support national liberation movements in Africa. It's another thing to be, you know, getting involved in Europe and apparently selling arms or providing arms to the IRA. And what 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 motivates him to get involved in all of this? Well, the, the, what motivates him is really a complex thing. What we could say that and sometimes he supported um, uh, awful groups like Idi Amin in Uganda or uh, Charles Taylor in Liberia or uh, uh, shadowy groups. But also, uh, as uh, when I visited South Africa, the South African uh, groups, all of them told me that the Soviet Union did not support us as much as the Gaddafi's regime. So the record for the Gaddafi's regime is mixed. Some of it was real. Some of it was really uh, supporting only groups that would support the ego and the legitimacy of the regime internally and regionally. So uh, that's what I have to say about that. But I think it became more the, the leadership in Libya became more uh, isolated, more personalized, and he played his game very well at the beginning. But then this is a guy who came from the countryside. He spoke with Hick Bedouin um, accent. He dressed up like them. Uh, he um, 
eight like them, and he played the symbolic, um, you know, um, uh, politics very well. But Libyan began to become really alienated from him, and and began to he began to rely more and more on security apparatus for sustaining his regime. The sanctions, uh, Paul, led to unintended consequences inside Libya, strengthened Gaddafi's regime and really uh, weakened uh, society more and led to a widespread corruption for people to survive within the bureaucracy. And in 1996, the regime committed a massacre, one of the worst in modern Libyan uh, history after at least the second half of the 20th century. They murdered 1,200 political dissidents in Libyan prison in the infamous Muslim prison massacre. And that haunted the regime even during the uprising because the people who protested in, in February 15, they were really uh, the families of, um, uh, of, the, of the men, uh, young men who were murdered in prison. Now, who were they? We had talked in the previous segment about the role of the National Front for the Salvation of Libya, old royalists connected with the CIA, who had a fairly open agenda of an armed overthrow of Gaddafi, and who actually admit, I believe, to having had cells in Libya that were trying to inf have influence in the armed forces, trying to overthrow him. So to what extent is this period kind of driven by that force? And, and, and so what I'm getting at is it's not purely paranoia on Gaddafi's part that pe there's some people out to get him. The prisoners were, some of them were radicalized youth who became Islamists. Some are um, active in other op uh, organizations that were opposing the regime. The majority of them were Islamists. And, and the regime, we know that uh, his um, very brutal um, and very, very much um, right hand General Abdullah Senussi, he himself led the shooting of those prisoners after alleged mutiny within the prison. To this day, we don't know the details, the bodies, the um, what exactly happened, but um, we know that the massacre took place. And in the last 10 years, Saif al-Islam al-Gaddafi tried to uh, lead some kind of a soft way of addressing the concerns of uh, the, the uh, murdered prisoners, but that hasn't been resolved completely. And that became a really an issue, uh, you know, later on when more people began to push for accountability. So as you head towards 2003, uh, Gaddafi is increasingly isolated, you're saying, from the Libyan people. Um, he's uh, still at, at great odds with, with the U.S. and the British. Uh, but something in 2003, he, he makes a deal. So what, what, what was the deal and why did he do it? Well, the deal, I think he's um, contrary to the image uh, of Gaddafi as sometimes crazy, sometimes he's um, is really uh, a clown. And so when it comes to Libyan uh, internal situation, he's a very shrewd uh, tactician and very has a very good grasp of Libyan culture and Libyan society, especially trying to mobilize the countryside against the cities and the urban areas. So he tried to always use uh, the populist um, language and use divide and, and, and rule kind of tactics internally. However, he knows that the Cold War is over. What happened in Iraq is, is also a very good lesson for him. And he tried to ensure his security by making a good deal with, with the Western government. That pushed him to conclude that the only way for him, to, for his regime to, 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 to survive is to make peace with it. And the Western government who are concerned about good news under the Bush administration. And also they were trying to find, um, come back to Libya and it's a very, very lucrative oil field. Uh, all of these factors played into, um, it was a good marriage between the Bush administration, Gaddafi's regime and other Western government, including the UK. And that led to a compromise or a deal where he turned uh, weapons of mass destruction uh, and he stopped his programs and agreed to pay all kind of compensations for the families, and they welcomed him as a reformed uh, dictator. Now, how much does this have to do with the in invasion of Iraq? The uh, you know, neoconservatives in the United States suggest this is part of a byproduct of the, in of the Iraq invasion that Gaddafi was afraid he would be next. No, it helped a little bit because it, put, it set the tone, but the negotiations between the Libyan regime and, and the United States and the European community started much earlier. So we can't say that the Iraqi um, uh, debacle really um, motivated this, but it did set the tone because the United States government also 
realized that they needed, uh, especially under uh, George W. Bush administration, they needed some good news. And we, we know that Iraq turned to be a, a huge disaster for that administration. And also the Tony Blair government in, in England, um, thinking about uh, all the economic and strategic interests in Libya, especially oil, they were also eager to come to the Libyan uh, economy and resume relations. The regime. So, just explain a little further. What, why was it in why Gaddafi makes this change? You're saying the negotiations begin before 2003, so it's concluded in 2003. But wh when he makes the deal in 03, and then and, and then the the full rapprochement in 08, uh, he kind of opens the doors to a whole I international monetary fund model, a whole new kind of neoliberalization of of Libyan economy. Uh, why does he go there? Well, he needed uh, some recognition, and he is a very, very astute animal of international relations. So he knew that his regime's um, uh, survival is really contingent on having some compromises. But interestingly, Paul, what he tried to do is very, very um, uh, kind of um, interesting because he wanted a uh, normal relationship with the United States and also European community, but he always wanted to drag his feet and not to have a full um, opening of Libya to uh, the United States specifically, because he is, I think d deep inside him, he uh, was afraid that any opening will lead to undermining his own regime and his own survival. And add to that something really uh, alien that alienated many Libyans. He began to groom his sons. So his sons began to really control major uh, positions um, have tremendous power and wealth. And when you talk about corruption of the regime, his sons come first to many, many, many ordinary Libyans. And I think that really um, uh, shows us that the, the, the old man, the old dictator is really out of touch with reality. There's been some reporting on the uh, Libyan Sovereign Wealth Fund based in London, who, who's essentially run by his son, not in name, but apparently, according to some of the reporting, no big decision gets made without being run through uh, the son. Yes. So then bring us up to before the recent events. Uh, what's been happening in terms of people's living conditions? Uh, why so much outrage breaks uh, when, once this wind catches on from Tunisia to Egypt? Why are people ready to move? And, and, how, and why are they ready to defy the security apparatus? Well, I think we have a, a courageous, very generous, very proud people, uh, despite the fact that we're talking of a small country, who thought that they could be saved the agony of unrest and violence. They waited for a long time and they were willing to give the regime a chance to uh, have a really serious reform, as I defined it to you earlier. When and let's just show, so by reform, you're talking about breaking up this concentration of wealth at the top Fight, elite, yes. fighting uh, corruption and a more democratization, reforming the uh, health system, reforming the educational system, opening the economy, uh, all the basic things that most Libyans agree upon. And they were promised, by the way, Paul, by his son, Saif al-Islam. And uh, the, the old dictator himself agreed that uh, Libya, uh, in Libya, corruption is widespread. The system failed uh, the people and that has to be addressed. And that's what you know, motivated many Libyans to say, well, we could reform the country. Maybe the system after 40 years will allow us to rebuild the country. But when the, this reform um, defined uh, program was aborted and violently aborted, the uh, many, many people who are really alienated frustrated, patient for so long, uh, then the people began to say, well, there is no point of reforming this regime. This is a hopeless regime. So uh, especially in the Eastern region with its history of anti-colonial resistance, with its stock of he thousands of heroes and, and poets and um, um, uh, resistant traditions, they were the first to defy the regime.